Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Lascom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Mrs. Evans? Here. Notice is hereby given that Scranton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, September 20th, 2012 at 6.15 p.m. in Council Chambers, second floor, Municipal Building, 340 North Washington Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. The purpose of said public hearing is to hear testimony and discuss the following. File of Council number 56, 2012, authorizing mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG program, Home Investment Partnership, Home Program, and Emergency Solutions Grant, ESG program, for the period beginning January 1st, 2013. Our first speaker is Ozzy Quinn. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Ozzy Quinn, Scranton Taxpayers Association. I want to pick up where I left off of last week when the first reading of the CDBG was before the council in regards to uh, the uh, housing rehabilitation in the city of Scranton. Uh, after that, I spoke to uh, Linda, and she sent me a under Avery, the executive director, and I says, uh, Highland, I wish to address the citywide housing and rehab using CDBG funds only, CDG funds only, at next week's public hearing. When was the last time CDBG funds were set aside for the program, formally operated in the city hall, not home or ESG for emergency repairs? CDBG. She said, he replied, I looked back at our HUD financial system and the 2000 allocation was for single family CDBG. This is where Habitat for Humanity. Well, that was Mayor Connors and I was the executive director of Habitat then. Yeah. But that wasn't for rehab, it was for new housing, not Meridian Avenue. Uh, it was funded for single family homes. She says, it is very misleading to indicate to the public that the city of Scranton does not have a housing rehab program. The city has a very active single family rehab program, citywide, along with the lead program. The only difference is, now get this, get this, off. we use home funding. This program has not changed except for funds being utilized to the home program and home funding can only be used for it. Okay, also let pay, okay, I hope this answers your question. She says OECD did appropriate 300000 in 2013, 2013 for Lackawanna and Neighbors for citywide, and uh, she said that they appropriated in 2012 125000 for Lackawanna and Neighbors. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to you know why they're demolishing all these buildings because people can't afford, you know, they have, they have problems, their porches are falling off, they need roofing, they need heating repairs, all these things. And there's no money available. And every city, as I said before, an entitlement city throughout the United States, and I read it, up to 20% of their CVBG grant each year is given towards housing rehabilitation. When I say housing rehabilitation, I mean contiguous, block by block by block. Not, not one, a, a buckshot approach, one up here and two in the south side. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really a shame when you say, uh, I said $50 million. I would say that they, since Mayor Doherty took office, he's used the CDBG only, okay? And none for uh, only with the, uh, one point, not even one percent. Last week I said to Mr. McGough, 10 percent. I correct myself, one percent, one percent. Yet 10 percent or 20 percent or 10 million dollars was given for administration, salaries, benefits, supplies, office space down at the Scranton Life Building. Okay? Now, what I'm asking for you to, here tonight is we can't continually see our housing 
be demolished, okay? 61%, according to the census, was built prior to 1939 or earlier, okay? Now, that, there's 34,641 units, okay? 30,069 occupied, 17,190 family, okay? So that means that 61%, okay? What I'm asking for, Mrs. Evans, members of city council, Mr. Irvin, you're at the OECD, okay? is to put $5,000, up to $5,000 set aside for next year for a housing rehabilitation, outside housing rehabilitation consultant to come in and show City Hall, uh, OECD, how they can organize a housing rehabilitation program that's, uh, that's a, uh, let's say, comprehensive throughout the city before we completely demolish all of our homes built before 1939. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Schumacher. Uh, Marie Schumacher, city resident and taxpayer. Um, I will be brief because I only have two things tonight um, on this particular budget request. Uh, but the first one is, I know I, until fairly recently, I always thought all of these nonprofits went out and raised money and did all kinds of good things and, and they helped people. But it turns out very many of them get all of their funding from the government or not over 90%. So I would have a request that uh, I maybe Mr. Rogan could uh, get with uh, get with Ms. Abley and and ask her, or otherwise let me know if if she refuses to do it because I can certainly look up the 990s and see. But I think uh, all of these people should be out raising some money on their own, and otherwise they're just quasi. Government, uh, government uh, departments. So I would really like for like that information before uh, the vote comes up on the. I believe you said it was the 25th of October, Mrs. Evans, and on what the percentages of each are. But the real thing I'd like to do is uh, ask that a portion of the half a million dollars that's set aside for economic development be used to uh, help seniors 65 and over and develop and disabled vets with the uh, tax increases that you that are going to be levied uh, if you there are 25 at least as of last year at the, about this time there were 25,813 taxable properties um, so 70 percent I've read in the paper this I have not verified but I'm taking it that the paper knows what they're talking about, that 70% pay less than $500, and um, therefore the 12% for 2013 would only be uh, $108,420 to, as, as according to my calculation, to uh, give se uh, seniors 65 and older over who live in their own home and make under a certain certain amount or maybe even all of them uh, uh, keep their taxes stable at last year's rate and use some of this economic development to suck up the uh, the raise because I think it's a true economic development issue if a lot of seniors are forced out of their homes uh, then again, what Mr. Uh, Mr. Quinn talked about, you're going to have a lot more blight. We know properties are not selling in Scranton, and uh, a lot are going on the market. And the more they go up, the more blight you create, and the more uh, houses of crime and drugs that tax our uh, our public service. So I think it would be a an excellent use and for economic development purposes to help the seniors that need the help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and 
just a few minutes. Certainly. Is there anyone else who would like to address council? This public hearing is adjourned. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who have died in the last week, particularly Michael Joseph Zangardi, loving son, grandson, brother, uncle, and friend, Marie Ruddy, devoted mother, grandmother of my former student Aaron, and great-grandmother, John Joseph Petrosky Sr., loving father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and World War II Army veteran, Anne Hickey Gavigan, loving mother, grandmother, and aunt, Mary Beth Corcoran, beloved wife, mother, daughter, stepdaughter of our friend Diane Doherty, sister and aunt, and their dear families and friends who suffer their loss. And also Mrs. Doherty Harrington, a longtime resident of Scranton, uh, who many visitors and also residents of the city of Scranton may remember as Phoebe Snow and her tours of the city of Scranton. And also keep in your prayers the Zahorsky family. A uh, good friend of mine, Dan Zahorsky, uh, lost his father uh, just recently. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A, audit status from Robert Rossi and Company, received September 13, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, applications along with decisions rendered by the Zoning Hearing Board on Wednesday, September 12, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, tax assessor's report, hearing dates from August 29th, October 3rd, and 11th of 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, Tax Assessor's Report, Appeal Hearings for October 10th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, Tax Assessor's Report, Commercial Appeals Hearing Date, October 31st, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do any council members have announcements at this time? The Fraternal Order of Eagles number 314 in Scranton will hold a chicken barbecue from 1 to 6 p.m. this Saturday, September 22nd. The cost is $8 and takeouts are available. All proceeds will benefit ALS. For additional information, call the club at 961 5495. Ruby Tuesdays, located at 15 Radcliffe Drive in Music, 
invites everyone to participate in its Give Back program on Wednesday, October 3rd from 4 to 8 p.m. 20% of your purchase will be donated to St. Francis of Assisi Kitchen in Scranton to feed the poor and homeless. You need only to present a flyer to your server for the donation to be made. Flyers are available in Council's office or visit the restaurant online at www.rubytuesday.com. That's it. Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker tonight is Les Spindler. Good evening, Council. Les Spindler, city resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first off, we'll talk about the University of Scranton, Mr. Allman's favorite subject. I agree with a lot of what he says, but uh, the other day in the paper, there was a letter to the editor, and uh, the gentleman had a great idea. Uh, he said, uh, Council should uh, pass an ordinance if uh, the university buys any more properties that they, it's not protected by their uh, nonprofit status, that they have to pay taxes on it. As Mr. Ellman said, they're just taking away all the taxpaying properties. For example, uh, he mentioned last week the corner of Jefferson Avenue, Mulberry Street. They tore down a taxpaying property. It's a green space with a big hunk of concrete saying the University of Scranton. It's what a waste. The city's making no money on that. Well, I think it's a great idea to have an ordinance where if they buy any more property, it's not tax free. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Spindler, actually, if uh, Solicitor Hughes joins us tonight, um, I'm going to ask him to report on uh, several issues, one of which will be Council's direction regarding the University of Scranton. Okay, thank you. Uh, next thing, big pet peeve of mine, I've been here many times, pit bulls. I'm sure everyone heard about the attack on Elephant the other day. It was tragic, I mean, it was a little dog. I had a little dog like that once. So. To hear about that, it, it made me sick. And thank God there was a person here to shot it. Because God knows what would have happened to that woman if he wasn't around. That she might have been severely injured or killed. Uh, may I approach Mrs. Evans? Yes. Sorry for the small print, but that's the only way printed out for me. Well, people come here and they defend pit bulls, saying it's it's the owner, it's not the dog. Well, what I have here is printed out ten myths about pit bulls, and the number one myth is that it's the owner, not the dog. Well, it's the dog, and I'm going to read the first myth. The outdated debate: it's the owner, not the breed has caused the pit bull problem to grow into a 30-year-old problem. Designed to protect pit bull breeders and owners, the slogan ignores the genetic history of the breed and blames these horrific maulings inflicted by the pit bull's genetic hold-and-shake bite style on environmental factors. While environment plays a role in the pit bull's behavior, it is genetics that lead pit bull victims with permanent and disfiguring injuries. The pit bull genetic traits are not in dispute. Many in U.S. courts agree that pit bulls pose a significant danger to society and can be regulated accordingly. Some of the genetic traits courts have identified include unpredictability of aggression, tenacity, high pain tolerance, and a pit bull's hold and shake bite style. According to forensic medical studies, similar injuries have only been found elsewhere on victims of shark attacks. Perpetuators of this myth also cannot account for many instances in which pit bull owners and family members are victimized by their own pets. From 2005 to 2011, pit bulls killed 128 Americans, about one citizen every 20 days. Of these attacks, 51% involved a family member and a household pit bull. In the first eight months of 2011, nearly half of those killed by a pit bull was its owner. 
Ren was even an avid supporter of Bad Rap, a recipient of Michael Vick's dogs. And there's nine more myths on here. So uh, again, I'm urging council to pass a, a dangerous dog ordinance. Pittsburgh has one where if you own a dangerous dog, I forget all the facts, but I think you're, you have to have like a, a seven or eight foot high fence. You have to have special insurance. You know, we need something like that. I mean, this wasn't its grant, but it's right in our backyard. It was elephant. There's, there's pit bulls all over the place. And, uh, this event happened uh, to a co-worker who lived four doors away. She didn't know that pit bull was there. So, uh, again, I hope council takes this into consideration. That's all I have tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ron Elman. Yeah, hello, Council. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Uh, you, know, you know, Scranton's just being attacked at, at all corners, it seems like. It, it seems like all these little jerkwater towns, all they need us for is to, lead, to have projects and, and dump all their nonprofits with us. It's, it's, nobody wants to help us. But the, you know they want us to join this and join that. It, it's time for for everybody to realize all this is nonsense. Where, where all the I, I hear all these people running for office, promising jobs and promising this and that. The, there's not going to be any more jobs. There's not going to be any more Chamberlain and it's head and factories, head and books and, and RCA. It's over with. We, we can't compete with nobody anymore because of the nonprofits have taken the heart of the city out. We've lost our tax base. You know, you people are going after the wrong one. You go after the taxpayers. You need to go after the universities and the colleges and all these phony nonprofits for, for a change. And you get them at their Achilles heel. And their Achilles heel is very simply these two little paragraphs and the five rules under them. This is the Nonprofit Charity Act. The university, there's no way in the world they can fall under it anymore. Uh, on their own admission, I forgot what month it was, they, they had an editorial saying they generated $400 million in the city of Scranton. You remember, Miss? Miss Janet, we talked yes. about it. Yes, I do. Anybody that generates $400 million certainly can't come under the Pure Charity Act any longer. You, you got Marywood buying $250,000 houses for investment. It's as plain as the nose on your face. One day, the banks are going to say no more. We're, we're under, we're, we're, there's just no way we can pay for any more loans from banks it's going to end, and everybody's going to be in bad shape except these universities. They won't have any depression. They'll be just living high on the hog, you know. When these, when these guys go eat lunch over there from, from the university at the Radisson, they have to pay a tax on, on their food bill. When they put gas in their car, then their Cadillacs and Cadillacs and, and, and Lincoln and Escalades, they pay tax. They don't mind that. But they don't want us. They don't want to pay a penny to us. <clears throat> it's just got to end. You you got to go after their Achilles heel, this this nonprofit purity act. You know I I don't always agree with council, but I want you all to know that that I, I respect your decisions and I support them and I support this council even when I get mad at you for for something that I don't agree on, which, which isn't, hadn't been too much. You, you just, a couple of weeks ago, Jack, and, and I'm not saying this adversely, you minimized the $200. It's not just $200, it's everything is going up. 
for a homeowner. And it's not stopping, it's just, it's getting, it's just getting, you, you got 2,000 people in the city didn't pay taxes. You know, nobody seems to be going after them. There's no reason there's 2,000 people. There must have been another four or 5,000 in the whole county didn't pay taxes. And our two, our two new commissioners, they're too busy with their nepotism inventing jobs for their friends. And then they complain that they can't get $100,000 people. You know, they need to come down to earth. The school board keeps hiring and talking about building schools at $3 million and they don't get bids. They just want to, it, it, the whole town just needs the FBI to come in here and do something like they did down at Wilkes-Barre. And Andy Jabola, he seems afraid to tackle like the school board. They took bribes and nothing's done about it. And people talk about it. This town is just as bad as Wilkes-Barre, and, and it's such a good city. It is. Yeah, I love this city, and I've, I've told you, I live here by choice. Well, I wish that you would reconsider attacking the, the cause of all our problems, which is these universities and the nonprofits, and all these developers that come in here and, and blow smoke in people's ear and what they're going to do. We have empty apartments that people are paying taxes on because they move into a new building that's not paying taxes for 10 years. This just doesn't make good sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David Lewis. Good evening. My, my name is David Lewis. I am the president and general manager of L.A. Lewis Moving and Storage here in Scranton. Uh, story of my life, it seems as though I'm a week late. Uh, I should have came to the council meeting last Thursday after the zoning hearing, which was mine, on the 12th of September. This hearing was the lowest blow to my family in over a hundred years. My family started in business here in 1899. I reside in the city of Scranton. 75% uh, of my family members reside in the city of Scranton. And what happened last Wednesday night is, is still just beyond words. It's, on, it's beyond comprehension. Um, for, first of all, uh, I own a business property at 1621 Washburn Street. Uh, the building was built in uh, 1963. My family operated the facility as their main office up until 1989. We moved our, uh, our main portion of the business to uh, 2401 Luzerne Street here in Scranton, which, uh, you know, we, we are continuing to operate. Uh, I employ uh, approximately 20 to 25 people at a given time, right here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, believe it or not. Uh, half of the people are Scranton residents. Uh, the sale of the property at 1621 Washburn Street was very vital to my business plan in order to survive. I, I'm going to say the biggest kick that I got was the city controller lives next to my property. And she got up and gave very damaging uh, testimony and was on um, a, a, the testimony, of, you know, it, just, it was just repetitive with, uh, with neighbors. Uh, it, it's just beyond words that neighbors have a very, very large impact on how this city is going to grow. It's a perfect example of last evening you had a zoning hearing. One block away, 
1600 block of Jackson Street. Basically, the same thing happened to that property owner that happened to me. The neighbors kicked up their heels, and basically the neighbors made the decision for the zoning board. My question to city council this evening is, how, how, what, what kind of plan does the city have in place for existing businesses like myself and the properties that we have maintained for years? How can we market these properties if this is going to be status quo of how, how uh, the outcome of these zoning hearings are? I, how many people are on the board? I was scheduled to be heard in August. Had to have a special meeting for me because there was only three people that showed up for the meeting, or three, three uh, zoning board members showed up for the hearing. And unfortunately, one of the zoning members had to recuse himself because he knows me. Probably, you know, you, you, most of you folks on the board know me, so you'd have to recuse yourself too. Uh, it, you know, it's just, it was just one comedy error after the other. Uh, you know, how, how many people are on the board? Uh, you know, aren't they supposed to be a full board every time the zoning board here, you know, is, is, has a regular meeting? Uh, why, why are they not attending? Now, three people that showed up in August weren't the same four people that showed up last week. Now, another kick in the pants, the fourth member disappeared. And only three people voted. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 one error after another after another, you know, and and it's just clear that you know the the neighbors are going to make the decisions on how this city is going to you know somehow recover. How how do you expect to attract business? You know, another one last week, Parody Cigar. What did we do to you know they're going to Dunmore? What, what did we do to keep those uh, 50 jobs or whatever it is on Main Avenue? Did we find them another location? Seems to me not. How, how are we going to grow this city? How are we going to get these taxes down to where they belong? Because we can no longer afford to pay the taxes in this city, especially as you propose uh, right, right now you have another uh, disaster that you're about to face. You're about to face the disaster where people that are commuting into the city are no longer going to come into the city of Scranton, which, uh, you know, that's, that's another issue down the road. I don't know if that was the one-minute warning or what, but uh, no, that, that you, have a, you have a very disgusted, you know, I'm, I, I, I manage a business that's over 100 years old in this city, and I, I need some guidance from the city of how we are going to proceed further. How can I sell my property? This, this sale was vital to, the, the, vital to my business plan. And unfortunately, I had to give the man his deposit back. Mr. Lewis, um, I, I did receive an email from uh, Mr. Borthwick, I believe you spoke to um, yesterday regarding your concerns. We will be in touch. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Gerard Hetman. Good evening, Council. Gerard Hetman from the Lackawanna County Department of Community Relations. Uh, first, we would like to report this evening that our first annual Lackawanna County Senior Health Fair, held last Tuesday, September 11th, at the Lackawanna County Trolley Museum, was a resounding success. We had over 200 senior citizens visit the health fair, a great many of whom were City of Scranton residents. We would like to thank City Council, as well as everyone in attendance at our meetings, and everyone watching at home, live, and on the rebroadcast, who helped us spread word of the Senior Fair 
to friends, neighbors, relatives. In talking with many of the visitors, we learned that many of them had learned of the fair by watching counsel, being a counsel, or again a referral from a friend or a neighbor who somehow witnessed council meetings or spoke to folks who were here regularly, council staff, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd like to thank you for your cooperation in making our event a success, and we certainly are working hard already to look at new ideas to make the next senior fair next year even better and hopefully grow the population that we're able to serve with the event and continue to provide a quality event that's of service to all of our senior residents in Scranton and Lackawanna County. Uh, with that in mind, our next event coming right up this coming Saturday, September 22nd, is our Heroes Day celebration held from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Lackawanna County 911 Center. And again, this constitutes an open house at the 911 Center with guided tours and also a large amount of emergency equipment on display, fire trucks, police cars, and other emergency vehicles and equipment. And I should note that these apparatuses and vehicles and equipment items are coming from agencies around the county. We tried to spread it around so that we could get as much participation over as broad of a geographic area as possible. And we will have Scranton represented with the Scranton Police Department's K-9 unit, which in conjunction with the Lackawanna County Sheriff's K-9 unit will be doing a joint K-9 demonstration for all in attendance. So we look forward to welcoming the Scranton Police Department as well as all the city residents who wish to come out to the 911 Center this Saturday for our event. Uh, we look forward to hopefully a good day weather-wise. It will be rain or shine and we would like to welcome everyone who would wish to attend of all ages. Uh, with the events in mind, I'd like to follow up on a suggestion from Mrs. Evans at the last meeting I attended uh, regarding our announcements possibly appearing on ECTV. I did speak with Mr. Joe Dorenzo, our Lackawanna County Communication Director, and he does issue press releases to all of our media outlets in Lackawanna County in Northeast Pennsylvania, which does include ECTV whenever we plan an event such as the Senior Health Fair or Heroes Day. And we will actually work with Mr. Dorenzo to increase those, that participation with ECTV for some of the other events that are planned for by other departments, such as the County Parks and Recreation announcements that we do read. Uh, but we do have a level of cooperation with DCTV, and as we do with every avenue that we look to to publicize these events, we will certainly work to improve that and build on that in the future as we do more and more things coming up. Uh, with that said, we have uh, two announcements from the County Parks and Recreation Department this evening. The first is concerning their 2012 Boys and Girls Basketball Clinic. For boys and girls in fourth, fifth, and sixth grades only, uh, there will be six campsites around the county during the month of October, one of which will be held at Scranton High School on October 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th. All clinics start at 6.30 p.m. sharp and end at 8.30 p.m. And uh, information on this can be obtained by contacting the Lackawanna County Parks and Recreation Department at 963-6764. And also the Lackawanna County Parks and Recreation Department will hold their 20th annual Children's Fishing Derby at Merle Sarnaski Park on Saturday, October 6, 2012. This is open to children ages 4 through 12, and all ages will fish from 11 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. And registration begins at 10.30 a.m., and the cost is $5 per child to enter. And for more information, they can also contact the Lackawanna County Parks and Recreation Department at 570-963. 6764. Again, our thanks to Council for helping make the Senior Fair a success. We look forward to serving senior residents of the county and, of course, of the City of Scranton well into the future. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Just like to begin with a brief follow-up from last week. Uh, as you know, I made a few uh, had a few questions uh, uh, for Councilman Lasko, and I know he was absent last week. Um, I had just uh, I had received uh, some notification from a citizen who uh, was actually had some interest in the uh, the issue of the police cars. We know I think I believe it was 13 that were out of service, and we were waiting for four new vehicles to arrive from New Jersey. And uh, I think we were just curious to know if we did receive those and if the other vehicles were back in service. Uh, I will be back in action tomorrow, actually, uh, speaking with the, the police chief and, uh, and visiting. Okay. I, I apologize. I, I was ill and just getting back to I understand. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, you know, I 
it's unfortunate I have to address this issue, but uh, and I do have to respond to the uh, Sunday newspaper article, I should say headline by the Scranton Times. Once again, uh, they want to go back to the scare tactics and the deceive the public into believing that there's going to be astrom astronomical tax increases with the recovery plan. And I just think it's, quite frankly, at this point, it's beyond frustrating. Uh, I don't know how many times this newspaper has to be told that it's a 35% tax increase. Not 79, not 80, not 90, not 100, not 1,000, whatever number they want to float out there. It's a 35% tax increase over three years, 12, 9, and 13. It's very simple. And yet they want to continue to play the worst case scenario. They want to continue to scare the public into believing that their taxes are going to be raised to the roof. And I am beyond frustrated. I, like I said, I don't know how many times this council has to tell them consistently that you've stated on the record it's a 35% tax increase. But we want to continue with the scare tactics. We want to make the issue political. You know, I think if we want to do investigative reporting, and if we, well, not investigative reporting, but if we want to talk tax increases and astronomical amounts, why don't we go talk to the county? Why don't we go over here and talk to the school district? Nobody ever says a word about the county or the school district. Yet everybody's up here week after week at this podium or the newspaper constantly criticizing this council and the city, the tax rate. Take a look at your tax bill. How many times have we gone over it up here? Councilman Laskin went over it, Mrs. Evans has gone over it, Mr. Joyce has gone over it. The city makes up the smallest portion of your tax bill. I believe the highest we've said was the school district. We never see anybody at the school board meetings, ever. Never see any letters to the editor. Never see any reporters. We never see anybody do any stories, any front page headlines. Oh, 100% tax increase, 1,000% tax increase. But we want to constantly go after the city and criticize council. We need to start reporting fact. It's just, it's, it's, it's totally, it's just, it, dis, it disgusts me. It truly does. We've been told it's wishful thinking, it's pie in the sky, that our revenue enhancements aren't going to come through. As I've said before, and as council has stated, how do we not know we can't realize anything unless we try it? We're told we're never going to receive anything from the nonprofits. We're told the commuter tax isn't fair. You know, we're told the sales tax isn't fair. The, the amusement tax isn't, isn't fair. We need revenue. We face serious deficits. And without the revenue, we're going to continue to stay the course and continue, year after year, continue to face deficits. We need money. And as I've said before, if we want to be critical of plans, then I suggest you come up with one yourself. And the infamous, infamous response I get all the time is, well, Mr. Miller, I wasn't elected. You're, you're right, you weren't elected. But if you're going to come up to the podium and you're going to write letters to the editor and be critical of the recovery plan, well, then you have one thing. It's a mouth. You do have a say in this town. You do have the ability to go out and vote. And if you don't like the things you, you see, you have the ability to make changes. Nothing prevents you from coming forward and adopting a plan yourself. No plan is perfect. We never claim that this plan was perfect. But at the same time, when you're objective and you go against somebody, I've always believed that you should do, do the homework yourself. And I can't say that we all did our homework. In fact, we didn't all do our homework. We thought no was the easy way out. No gets you nowhere. It just continues to lead down the path we're in right now. We can't continue to stay the course. We need to move in a new direction. We need innovative ideas. That's what we did here. You might not like the plan. You might laugh about it. You think it's a joke. It's not a joke. These are difficult decisions. And anybody that thinks that this council made decisions that were easy, they need to get their head examined. They weren't. Raising taxes is a very difficult decision to make, especially a year before an election. They're not popular. You face criticism. I, I find it to be unfair because you were placed in this position. This didn't all happen overnight. This isn't something that's gone on for three years. This is a decade's worth of fiscal mismanagement that all of a sudden was dumped into your lap. And now you had to come up with the enhancements. But what really infuriates me is that if we go back to when this council initially put forth revenue enhancements, that maybe today we'd be singing a different tune, as I've said, that if this administration had followed through on Street Smart and every other enhancement that you had, we wouldn't be talking about all these other so-called so nuisance taxes that people are against. And that leads me into this morning's article on the commuter tax. We now have a group that is rallying people to come in and protest the 1% commuter tax. As I've stated before, it goes back to what I've said before. What's your plan? And I'm going to continue to say it. And I know people are going to come back with the same response. I wasn't elected. I don't care that you weren't elected. It has nothing to do with being elected. When you go against something, you do the homework yourself, and you present a plan. How many times, Mrs. Evans, you sat up there for years as a lone minority councilwoman, knowing full well that past rubber stamp councils, they weren't going to look at your budgets at all. They weren't even going to give them the time of day. But you knew that you couldn't just simply say no. 
you had to have a plan. You had to have a, had a, you had to have a vision. And you always did. So what I'm asking all the critics to do is come up with a plan. Come up with a vision. What course do you think we need to follow? If you don't like what you see, then come up with something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, well, I guess I'll start with, um, and then I'll switch off here, but you know, the recovery plan isn't real. It's not a recovery plan. Anybody who believes that has to be either crazy. Well, they just have to be crazy. Okay, I don't see any of those things coming to light, and I'm glad that people are fighting against them. I think that um, our city's got a lot of problems, and we've elected a lot of people that I think weren't competent and have taken us the wrong way, but the residents here voted for them. So be it. Um, and I'm, I would like to say that um, borrowing money isn't going to make us successful. And um, with that said, I'd like to switch gears here a little bit, talk about the zoning board. Um, I own a house on 1215 Stafford Avenue. There was a triplex from the day it was built. Now, Mr. Wallace, and you know, some people seem to believe I get along with the mayor, and that's definitely not right. Because the mayor sent Mr. Wallace up to condemn my home with the city's uh, inspections department. Well, they came through, there was nothing to condemn it on, or any of my properties, as Stacy Brown wrote in the Scranton Times newspaper at the time. But we uh, proceeded into uh, the zoning board. Well, Mr. Walls and the zoning board stripped my home of its right to be a rental because they said it was an illegal conversion. So when Mr. Lewis gets up here and speaks, I think it's really time to recognize, in my opinion, what's occurred here. We've created a city that is hostile to development, hostile to success, um, thinks that at this point, when all the chips are down, you know, I've sat in this council chamber for over 20 years and listened to people speak, okay? I remember when bankruptcy was actually brought up by the council, and they stated and, um, that that was probably the way to go, but they had a different vision for this city. Well. You know, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that the residents of this city can't afford this tax, and the time has come for them to decide if they want to still keep electing spaghetti dinner politicians to run the city. And it's really hurt us. Um, you know, when you read the Ryan's book on zoning, your solicitor probably knows what that is, it sets rules for zoning. Well, it's a book that exists. And in many instances, the zoning board pays no attention to it whatsoever. And then you take people that have to be forced into the court of common pleas or a higher court and spend money, fight their own city. And you know, appointments to the zoning board, I think people should have to take a test before they're allowed to be given that power because the great amount of harm they can do to an individual, a property owner, a business, or a city. And when you take a look at where this city is, as Ozzie Quinn spoke, you know, we're, we're tearing down so many homes, it's ridiculous. I came here, I think it was last week, and talked about 202 that were torn down with federal money. Now, one of the council members smiled and laughed about that. But you know something? I think that just goes to show that when you elect people that don't understand the people they represent, then we get a city like we have now. And the people outside the city that are fighting the commuter tax and the sales tax, they're right. They didn't create this problem, the city did. The city had a commuter tax before, the city knew it had problems, but you know the big thing that hasn't been discussed is a shortfall in the pensions. Not even the legislature, I think, wants to address that. And you know, when a, with the nation $16 trillion in debt, 40 cents of every dollar spent is borrowed, I think we've got a real problem. 
And I think the problem is, to be honest, we're electing the wrong people. We should be electing dishwashers, cooks, just people that have an understanding of what money is and what it means when you place a debt on somebody else's property. You know, you don't have to go to Harvard to understand how the economy should work. We've exported all our jobs, and we have all, and the people that did this to us, they were all Democrats and Republicans, alleged leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Spiraglia. <clears throat> Andy Spragley, Mrs. Scranton Fellows, Grantonians. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you, too. Your 7B final reading of resolution and ordinance. Let's go back a back around it. The mayor took out an option on the old Penn Security Building up there in Southside. Mr. McGough sets up an authority with Fenucci and Gatelli. Okay? Now, he wants this library built. So how does he do it? Look at your B. By restricting the people from using this library from its intent. It wasn't intent for that library to be used as a depository. It was to be used as a library for the general public. Why would you want to restrict it? For, why is that even in there? Actually, Mr. Spiraglia, um, we directed our solicitor to work on this particular piece of legislation, and it's going to be amended tonight as you requested. Because I see no turn. This is like, I'm willing to give you money, but under these conditions. And it's not right. When they founded this library long ago, they must have been in love with the city like I am. They had to be, to spend that much money and put that much beauty into that building. And they put it in there for a specific reason, that the public could use that library as long as it stood. And that was the intent. Why they would put this in to negate that intent is beyond me. First of all, the grant is fine. I have nothing against the grant. I have something against you taking this library and say you can only use for 50 years. The Times, did you read the Times editorial in the paper where it says they want to use this as a depository that we build up a, a new library and spend more millions and millions of dollars and put us in debt for a new library that we don't need? When this was brought up long ago, I said, why can't we have the school admin building when they're ready to get out? And was told, well, the college has an option on it. Why should the college be more important than the people of Scranton? If anything should have been done, we should, if that should ever come up, we should use eminent domain and make that the library annex if we so need one. But to sit up there and spend millions and millions of dollars because he likes that bank up at Penn Security is beyond me. There was no need for it. There is no need for it, and there shouldn't ever be a need for it as long as that library stands. It should be open to the public forever. Mr. McGough, you can shake your head all you want. Mr. Spragley, That's what you did. No one else did that. You were even going to lose your ability to control the legislature. That's why you pushed that library authority in there. You were already, Fenucci okay. and Gatelli were already gone. And you push that through with three votes. Don't tell me what happened. I sat there and constantly sat there and watched you do things like that until we are where we are. This didn't happen for two years ago. This happened on the year watch. A lot of damage was done on the year watch in the previous council watch. I seen them give a ports of land for 198 years for a dollar a year. And that made sense to the council. It didn't make sense to me, but it made sense to the council. 
And when they hit and said, subordinate your loan. We'll give you electricity lights, the fixtures, as collateral. And I told that council then, they were stupid and they were dumb. They said, well, they're going to go bankrupt. I said, let them go bankrupt. At least we wouldn't be on the dole for this money that we owe now at this 108 loans. We watched these councils destroy the city. People came up and spoke. Many, many people came up and spoke. And they made sense. But no one listened because they had their own agenda. And the agenda was to destroy the city's financial stability. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Seven, can I just Mr. make just one comment, Donna? The, the legislation dealing with the library, 7B, does nothing to restrict the use of the library. The, all, it, all it says is that in order to accept these funds, it must stay as a library for a minimum of 50 years. It does nothing to change the original charter. Thank you. Ms. Evans, if I could respond. Uh, <clears throat> there is, and I drafted the legislation tonight to amend this, Mr. Uh, Mr. Spiraglia. Um, it goes back to 1890 when Mr. Albright transferred the property to Mr. Smith and three other people uh, to then be transferred to the city after he built the library. In accordance with the deed, that library must be a free public library for the citizens and residents of the city of Scranton forever. The legislation has been amended to provide for that tonight so that there's no misunderstanding. This council tried to disband the Scranton Public Library Authority. We did everything we could to have it disbanded before the deed was conveyed so that it would still be city property. However, it was done we are really powerless to disband that authority. But what it is, this is the condition of the state grant that it must be open for 50 years. However, the legislation has been amended with, so that it states that, 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 the, that the Albright Library must be a free public library. It can't be a depository. It's a free public library for the residents and citizens of the city of Scranton forever. And as we say in the ordinance, in perpetuity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dave Dobson. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, okay. Today I bumped into a few of uh, John's friends and they were on the fire truck. And uh, they made a mention to me about these, this commuter tax and all. If any of these outlying communities uh, wish to uh, avoid the commuter tax, maybe they could take all the donations that they give to uh, certain politicians in this town and uh, donate it to our uh, bankruptcy fund <laughs> instead. Uh, we, they, they mentioned uh, 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 election uh, campaign posters on lawns up in Dalton stating who they want to be uh, running in Scranton. Shame, shame, shame. I mean, you know, if, if you want to spend money that way, you could always help us out with a few contributions to our fireman's fund or whatever. And uh, I'd also like to mention uh, the university once again. Uh, and this goes for everybody. I've been saying it now for a couple of months, and I'd really appreciate if we could look into how we could zone out uh, any further nonprofits and, and just tell them they have to pay the tax if they want to move here. Uh, that's all there is to it. We can't do it anymore. Uh, it sounds like all oh, under five hundred dollars, but then you have uh, uh, property tax most of us. But then you have uh, you have uh, your wage taxes and everything else that are high, and then on top of that, uh, we we have a lot of problems being a city where we have people that are homeless, 
people that are been, have been driven crazy by homeless, we have increased crime and so forth, people that are uh, actually, uh, you, could, you could measure the amount of crimes you, you can expect uh, by the amount of poverty that, uh, uh, from recessions and depressions and so forth. So uh, we really need to give them a zone and whatever's lost is lost. And then after that, they have to pay taxes on it. Uh, pools. Uh, I don't want to hear any more about any splash parks or uh, uh, bathhouses being built or whatever. Let's keep the pools open that we have. If we have to mothball them for a year or two, so be it. But I don't want to tear down something and then, oh, of course, so who knows what has to be contributed. Uh, from the city, may, maybe 20% or whatever, and it sounds like money coming in, but all it is is enriching somebody else, uh, some construction outfit that does a slipshot job in most cases from what I could see. And uh, I'll, I'll be listening careful on 5B and C, and we'll, that's all I'll go from there. And once again, any meters that come into this town have to accept change. I don't know, if somebody has change in their pocket, they probably don't have two nickels to rub together, but I always have a quarter because I want to pull in and pull out. I stop at Markowitz Tobacco or something and buy uh, a cigar and, and I'm out of there in 10 or 15 minutes. And That's what I want to pay. I don't want uh, service charges and all kinds of baloney with my credit card in addition to the exposure of, uh, of uh, identity theft. Uh, on this library, I apologize for anything that was misconstrued, but I do appreciate that if it's for perpetuity. And it's the Scranton Times that's coming up with this bright idea. They have a lot of bright ideas for our town. Too bad they didn't stay here. Uh, Basically, their editorial board can stay up in Abington where the hell they belong, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and also available at the library, once again, is free lunch, how the wealthiest Americans enrich themselves at government expense and stick you with the bill, how uh, the uh, pension plans are looted, like our firemen and police is down about $30 million, compliments of the clowns and thieves on Wall Street. And he also has a new book out, fine print, where employees are being taxed and used for renovations on their plant, and uh, the state of Ohio is letting them do it. And there's probably a hundred other examples in there. And once again, the vote, that was a joke. Uh, I don't know where our Supreme Court is. I don't know where these people get law degrees from. I, I, I don't know, maybe they do a little tech or something like that. Uh, but uh, shame, on, shame on our Supreme Court. Now they kick the can down the road further. And there's all kinds of people. I was at the conference last night. There's all kinds of people having all kinds of trouble getting uh, a vote, getting the right to vote. And uh, Mr. Metcalf uh, blew them off today. Well, you know, I'm glad I don't have to vote for him. Uh, or it would be nice to vote against him. <laughs> and once again, the Golden Parrot, uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, Johan, Mr. Johan, Mr. Burr, and Pat Toomey, they put a bipartisan vet employment bill, co-sponsored and amended, and voted to continue the filibuster. One vet every 80 minutes commits suicide. Uh, so they need jobs. We have 225,000 unemployed vets in this country. And probably the reason they're unemployed is because they had to go over there, and which they really didn't want to do. Thank you, Thank and have you. a good night. And don't Thank forget, Bach Bach. Is there anyone else who'd like to address council? Good evening, Council. Still Marie Schumacher, resident and taxpayer. Um, 
Good evening. I would like to clarify my, my state of the, the figures I used before because they were based totally on those who only pay $500 a year in taxes or less. But I still do believe that some level of, based on um, assets and age um, and income, our 65-year-olds and, and disabled folks need help. And I think that economic development is a perfect place to use it. Okay, um, I played around with the figures that I'd done, much like uh, much as Boris had done uh, with the entire county. And what I did was take the um, the local taxes that we pay, the school, the wage, um, county, municipality, and. And I use the median household income to make all my calculations. And it turns out that in the city of Scranton, you're sort of buying your house twice. Because if you get a 30-year mortgage, it takes every 27 months, you have paid the principal on the In, in proper using the on local taxes. So you have paid the principal, yet you have three more years probably to pay on your mortgage because that's got the principal and the interest. So uh, that's pretty short. Uh, the, the longest uh, is uh, in the county is Scott Township. They don't get their house rebought for 52 years. Uh, you know, that's, that's like almost double what it is in Scranton. And frankly, we can't afford it. You know, um, Norm France, in his book, Money and Wealth in the New Millennium, that came out in 2001, uh, has this quote. Gold is the money of kings. Silver is the money of gentlemen. Barter is the money of peasants. But debt is the money of slaves. And I fear the city of Scranton... Um, is turning into the latter category. We are slaves to debt. Uh, we're, in this year alone, we're going to increase our debt somewhere between a third and a half of what it was when we started the year. Um, and I can't tell exactly what it, whether that, what that is because that will segue into a question on when we're gonna see the 2011 budget, uh, uh, audit. We don't even know what our status was at the end of last year. So um, I would hope that we will get some information on that tonight. The, um, with respect to 7A, since it's gonna be voted on tonight, and since it's a five-year budget, I think uh, you need to amend it to in include the parks and rec, the addition of the Southside Sports Complex sports complex replacement that we were promised when the existing one was sold to the University of Scranton. Um, I think young people and young adults need a place and, uh, and that, was a, that was a terrible thing that happened. And I do think it should be amended to include that. Um, and then now I'll go back to my, my, we, my list from last week. Uh, First of all, uh, do we have now the the parking, the bill, uh, who, who received the parking? Actually, I did uh, receive an email back from our business administrator today uh, with the, with the um, a list and, and I'll forward that over to you. Okay, thank you. And now, now that the, uh, now that the Scranton Parking Authority garages are under the uh, control of a for-profit, does that mean they will also now be paying the property, the uh, sales tax? That's actually an interesting point. Um, Mr. Hughes, could you clarify more on that? It's my opinion that they do not have to pay the parking tax based on the City of Pittsburgh versus Pittsburgh Parking Authority case, which was uh, a ruling by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. They are merely administering it for the trustee. They, they are not a lessee of the garage. Even okay. if they were a lessee, there might be an issue on that. But they are merely um, 
managing it for the trustee on behalf of the Scranton Parking Authority. Okay, thank you. And while we're on the parking garages, does do the parking garages include all the retail space, or does the authority still uh, take responsibility for the leasing and? No, the parking garages are under the control. I mean, the retail space in the parking garages are under the control of the receiver. Okay. The retail spaces do pay real estate tax. Yeah. They are assessed and do pay real estate tax. I understand. That. And they will continue to pay real estate tax. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, but while I'm on solicitor use, do you have any new, if I may ask, mm -hmm. uh, several weeks ago you brought up the, the ice box and the, the fact that they very probably owe us $600,000. What? <laughs> if I didn't have to sleep, I could probably work at this job 24 hours a day. And if I didn't have a private practice. I, I devote a considerable amount of time, you know, to this. Um, it, I, I have done research on it. I believe right now, based on my research and discussions with the assessors, the assessors will be taking action on that. I believe that, that not I believe, but when I do have time, I would want to discuss this with Attorney Kelly uh, so that, you know, I cannot bring a lawsuit on behalf of the city. That's up to the city solicitor's office. I think the entire transaction has to be looked at. And I've looked at it. There was a redevelopment plan adopted down there in accordance with the original lease. I have and I stated it two years ago when I looked into this, I thought that there was something drastically wrong. I, I will, it's, it's on my list to give Attorney Kelly a call and to give him my ideas on this as to how the city should proceed. Thank you. That's all I was In order to collect the $600,000. It it's correct. my opinion the $600,000 is due and owing today. That's and it should be paid by BRT ICE. That's been mine for a long time. Thank you. I'll be back with the rest of my list next week, good Lord willing. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address uh, council? Hey, hey Chrissy. Jackie, good to see you back. I missed you last week. Jack is back. What's up, Jackie? What's up? Oh, Frank, you're the mate. We got a butt kicked. You know that, don't you, Frank? Yeah. Don't want to be by one lousy point. Frank, what's going on with these guys? <laughs> well, I know something, Jack. These friendly dogs are Jack doing a good job down there. Keep it up, Donna, boys. I love you one year. Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Oh, um. I had a public service announcement. Uh, very briefly. Yes. I was, I was very impressed with uh, Miss Miss Evans's. Uh, uh, earlier uh, announcing all the activities for the next week. This upcoming weekend, the Junior League of Scranton is participating or has a touch a truck uh, program at our Na on Nayog Park. Uh, local trucking companies, as myself, will be there with trucks. Uh, and that starts at 11 o'clock in the morning in Nayog Park and ends at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Bring your kids and touch the truck. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, was that Saturday or Sunday? Did you Saturday. Saturday? Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Mr. McGough, do you have any comments or motions? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to address the uh, issues of the zoning board. Uh, ironically, uh, I was speaking with one of the members of the zoning board today and, uh, about some things that were going on. And one of the things that he did bring up was that attendance at the zoning board meetings has been uh, very lax. That very often. Oh, thank you. Uh, that very often there are only three members present, and many times it's not three of the permanent members that they are, you know, that they are, it's necessary to call the alternates, and very often the alternates 
have been unwilling to come. Um, and, and that does pose a problem. The primary problem, not only with some consistency in a vote, but one of the problems that he said it's bringing up and that Mr. Lewis kind of alluded to was that very often they're having to re, um, re-advertise for meetings, which is an added expense, you know, that to advertise the meetings because they don't have a quorum to make decisions. Um, I would, I, I don't know what we as a council can do about that, but um, the way in which the, the appointments to the board have worked in the past, and we, we've all, um, we're all responsible for one member of the board, the zoning board. Um, I think that maybe uh, one of the things that we should do is that we should contact those people that we are responsible for appointing and find out if they are in fact going to be um, you know, members or active members of the zoning board and if they're not to resign from the position and allow allow for you know to reappoint those positions I, I, I think it's important that there's some consistency on the zoning board so that we are getting a, a, a consistent vote on, on things pertaining to uh, zoning. And the other thing that we did talk about today, uh, again, something that Mr. Lewis brought up, that very often some of, the, some of these votes are being, are being made based simply on influence from the outside, be it neighbors or other businesses, whatever, and in um, opposition to what the zoning codes are. Uh, that they're, that rather than, you know, making that difficult decision and saying to the neighbors, now this is, you know, what, what's being proposed is within the, you know, the, the law or the codes, and therefore, you know, we're going to approve it. They're, they're um, really voting in opposition to what is legal and, and what really should be done. Um, so I, I, I think that perhaps in, um, you know, that we should take a, really take a look at the, um, the nature of the zoning board at this point in time and, um, perhaps do something to um, at least improve the, um, the operation of it. Um, if, you know, I, I, I just think it's something that we should at least look into at this point in time, especially the attendance of oh, yes, members. Yes, because they have alternates. And, and, and that's why I just say, I, I said when you were, were out of the room that uh, the alternates have not been very responsive um, that in, in, you know, that many of them are called and have refused to you know, or not gone to the meeting so uh, you know we're, how, how many alternates are, are there three I'm trying to remember it's five board members and two I think two, two, alternates. two alternates yes um, so to get three out of seven people for most meetings is Really, I, I don't think that that's, uh, that's the way it was intended to be. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, you know, I, I, that's something I think that we can discuss at, at some point in time. Um, rental registration, just very quickly. Um, I am told that bills have been sent out, that the, the billing has begun, um, and hopefully, you know, we will, you know, get the, the ones that are identified, uh, the bills to the, those properties identified. And I know we've talked about various ways of uh, improving the database that we have. And I was contacted by uh, a member of the, uh, I think it's Southside Neighborhood Association, South Scranton Neighborhood Association. And they said that 
their members would be willing to go through their neighbor that you know whatever neighborhood they define as their kind of area to identify rental properties um, and I I thought personally it was you know maybe a way to build the database um, I don't know if it's within if we want to get involved <laughs> in neighbors doing that mm -hmm. but um, again uh, I, I would like to pose it to to the council as um, you know something to discuss and possibly if, if we feel it's a good idea to possibly you know propose to the other to other neighborhood associations to do the same thing but I but I think it is something that we need to discuss and whether we we want mm -hmm. to give that power or authority to um, these associations and last thing a recovery plan um, perhaps uh, one of the that we as a council I, I, I think one of the things that we can start to there are so many things that we that need to be done uh, in order to um, bring this recovery plan or make this recovery plan viable I, I think it's imperative on our part that that we get to work on some of the things that we can control um, and I, I look at first the amusement tax mm -hmm. if we could if we could possibly work on this and have it um, on the you know put something that we want on the agenda prior to 2013 mm -hmm. so that when when we are looking at the budget for 2013 it's already um, in place and um, ready to be um, implemented um, also perhaps the real estate transfer tax that we can you know do the legislation on that and have that ready for the budget and the last thing um, going back to the rental registration perhaps we can discuss the the idea of a rental registration coordinator to hopefully improve that and maybe have an RFP um, <coughs> in 2012 so that that person can be in place for 2013 um, just some ideas uh, for things that we can do to get prepare for 2000 the budget and for 2013 and that's all I have thank you Thank you. I, I'm sorry one last thing sure um, I meant to mention earlier um, October 7th uh, the 17th annual Steamtown Marathon will be held um, it is too late to register they they have um, they have a full registration I think they've registered close to third to 3,000 um, runners and uh, but I'm sure that they would still be looking for volunteers and it really is a little too late to start training for it so you're you're really lucky if the registration is closed uh, you won't be tempted to go out there and try but uh, yeah be prepared for it. it it's a great day it's a great weekend and uh, you know but it does tie up the city for a few hours so mm -hmm. just so you know thank you thank you and I just wanted to add that um, I happened today to run into uh, one of the inspectors from LIPS who said that uh, over 700 letters went out for the rental registration program within the last week and that uh, in the last few days um, I believe it's $3,400 was remitted so it's a start good start <laughs> Mr. Rogan, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, very briefly. Um, most of the items I have are positive this week, which is very nice. Um, yesterday I met with um, residents from Pinebrook Neighborhood Association, Sandy Banks, and uh, Mark Seitzinger from LIPS regarding some of the problems they had in their neighborhood. It, it seemed to be a very productive meeting, and um, Mark actually just followed up with an email um, before the meeting started he'll be down in that neighborhood again trying to work on some of the blight issues and um, since rental registration was brought up that was one of the other issues that we we discussed and um, as Mr. McGough mentioned in the past they are working on a numerous numerous ways of 
putting this list together. Um, some of them, one of them is through the sewer bills that come in. Um, you know, the other thing is, in the past, people have tried to get around the rental registration by listing it as the property as an LLC. And now that's putting up a red flag so they can look into it. Um, he explained a bunch of different things that they are doing to try to make sure they could get a database that, that will be accurate and get these notices out to, uh, to the landlords that need to pay. And I was very encouraged by that. And also, he, he also informed me, you know, we were speaking a little bit about the issues in Pinebrook and blight in different neighborhoods. When the rental registration safety inspections began, I asked that they would first take place in neighborhoods that are blighted. Um, we wouldn't want to start off in, you know, Mayor Doherty's block of Greenridge when there's no blight. But when you have other neighborhoods throughout the city that have blight, that would be the logical place to start the inspections. Although, at the end of the day, they all have to be inspected. And we also spoke about the idea of hopefully in the future the program being self-sustaining. That if it could bring in enough revenue after it's set up, possibly another inspector could be brought on to do rental registration inspections throughout the city and uh, just to crack down on blight in the neighborhoods in general. Um, another good thing in the community, the Kaiser Valley flooding issue. Um, residents in Kaiser Valley have let me, they let me know that the sewer authority has been doing great work down there. I know I'm hard on the sewer, sewer authority many times, but they deserve uh, credit for doing good work there. The project should be wrapping up soon, and hopefully um, the residents in that neighborhood won't have to deal with it, the constant flooding of their front yards every time we get a little bit of rain. And um, the issues with, that came up are regarding the CDBG money, I will be bringing all these up to Ms. Abley. Um, and a lot of them that were brought up I think are good ideas. We just have to check to make sure that they are eligible for the funding. And that is what I will bring up. I'll, I'll put all this together in the morning and, and get that to her and then report back. And then you know, after hearing from the public, we'll be compiling amendments. Um, I know a few of you have already provided and others wanted to wait until after public hearing. So we'll be getting those, we'll be getting that together and trying to allocate the money in the areas that will be the best for the most amount of people in the city. And finally, I just have one request. Um, Mrs. Craig, can we please send a letter to the administration and the fire chief asking if there are any city fire trucks that have been loaned out to any other municipalities? And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have any comments or motions this evening? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Just briefly, uh, I apologize for my absence last week. I've uh, had a few health issues I had to take care of, and I'm glad to be back here. Um, I will, uh, because I have a lot of catching up uh, phone calls, emails, and stuff like that, I will be working on that before prior to the next meeting. Um, I will have reports on the fire department over the past month, station closings and, and responses, how it affects your neighborhoods. Uh, I will have a report on the uh, police department vehicles, the main maintenance and uh, vehicles that are under order, and I will have an update next week on that. Um, just to add to what Mr. Um, Rogan mentioned about Kaiser Valley, I do have a letter that I would like to, uh, to read. Dear Honorable Council Members, as most of you are aware, I have been begging for help with the major water and flooding issues in Kaiser Valley, mainly my street. I approached City Council in the City of Scranton in 2005 after the flooding in November of that year and asked for help. I continued to ask the City for help for seven years. Neighbors have been looking for a resolution prior to me and my wife purchasing our home for nearly 30 years. I had meetings with two former state representatives, three city DPW directors, representatives of the governor's office, numerous city council members, and two state senators. I have also had an unsuccessful caucus with former DPW director Jeff Brazil. He committed to fixing the problem and never did. The only response of individuals were four members of this current City Council and the Scranton Sewer Authority. After seven years, 43 letters, 
numerous unsuccessful phone calls and meetings, I am extremely happy to notify this City Council that the Scranton Sewer Authority has been working tirelessly for almost three weeks on fixing the issue. They are in the process of installing new lines down Lafayette Street from Kaiser Avenue. They connect it into an 18-inch main that comes from Kaiser Avenue and drain into our neighborhood. They also put in new catch base basins along Lafayette Street, and, I th and they believe this will resolve the issues. Mr. Gene Skelton of the Authority has personally spearheaded this project and is determined to get this fixed. He has been in contact with me almost on a daily basis. He is the reason this project is getting completed. After seven years of flooding and frustration, he needs to be highly commended for giving this project the attention it needed and deserved. I would also like to thank the men that are working on the project. I can only speak for myself and my family, but we are extremely grateful for this project finally getting attention and coming up on to completion. I also want to sincerely thank this council and more importantly, Gene Skelton, the Board of the Sewer Authority and the men that have been working tirelessly to get this job done. And uh, I would just like to add, I, I know all of us here have been involved in, in, in this situation as we are with many others. It's nice to see progress on something you've been working on for a few years happen, um, especially these kind of conditions. We have these problems elsewhere in the city and I hope uh, the sewer authority will continue to work with them. I have uh, met and, cons and uh, discussed situations with Mr. Skelton on many occasions and he's always uh, tried to do whatever he can. I think that the, the final fruition of this came about when it was clarified that uh, you know the sewers, the storm sewers, <coughs> are the responsibility of the sewer authority and not the city because uh, I believe they were sort of holding back at that time so there were no cross uh, uh, problems between the DPW and, and the sewer authority at that time. So being that that was resolved I think we can see uh, further advancement with the help of our, our sewer authority to progress in the other areas of the city that we still have some of these problems and I too would like to commend them for the job they're doing and uh, and this was uh, Charlie Newcomb actually uh, and Mr. Newcomb for uh, you know staying on top of it and keeping us advised also and that's all I have for this evening thank you thank you Mr. Loscom Councilman Joyce do you have any motions or comments today? yes to begin tonight I'm going to address the Scranton single tax office we have received correspondence from tax collector Bill Courtright regarding the Scranton Single Tax Office's collections and distributions for the period ending on August 31st, 2012. First, in regard to real estate tax collection, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $11,616,728.80. In real estate taxes that current real estate taxes. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $10,965,343.96. With this in mind, there's been an overall increase in real estate tax collections of $651,384.84 thus far. Secondly, in regard to delinquent real estate tax collections for this year so far, the tax office has collected $470,445.86. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $550,938.74. With this in mind, there has been an overall decrease in delinquent real estate tax collections of $80,492.88 thus far. Third, in regard to the local service tax, for this year so far, the tax office has collected $1,023,182.04. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $1,299,619.34. With this in mind, there's been an overall decrease in local service tax collections of $276,437.30 thus far. Fourth, 
in regard to the business privilege and mercantile taxes for this year so far, the tax office has collected $1,703,798.94. In the same period last year, the tax office collected $1,381,051.54. With this in mind, there's been an increase overall of $322,747.40 in business privilege and mercantile tax collections thus far. Also to report, the Scranton Single Tax Office has collected $6,106,987.09 this year in earned income taxes. As far as offering a comparison to the amount collected last year, it would not be comparing apples to apples since Berkheimer took over the collection of 2012 earned income taxes. The $6,106,987.09 figure collected by the Scranton Single Tax Office this year is primarily fourth quarter income tax receipts from 2011 that were paid in this current year. While we're on the subject of the tax office, to inform, proposals were opened on Monday, September 17, 2012 for the rebid of the Scranton Single Tax Office independent audit for the year ending 12-31-2011. Both Joseph Alou and associates, as well as Benita and Rainey, certified public ac accountants, submitted bids. With this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please contact Mrs. Novembrino and inquire whether or not a firm has been selected to complete the audit of the Scranton Single Tax Office. In addition to the bids being open for the Scranton Single Tax Office audit, RFP proposals were opened on Wednesday, September 12th, 2012 in council chambers for the city pharmacy benefit manager services. Proposals were submitted by three companies being Catamaran, Express Scripts, and Millennium. With this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please contact Ms. McAndrew and inquire if a pharmacy benefit manager for the city has been selected yet. Regarding the capital budget, I'm going to make a motion tonight during uh, seventh order to table this legislation. To this date, I've only received input from one council member re regarding amendments and the prioritization of uh, the sections of the capital budget. In addition, with our council solicitor being busy this week due to minor surgery, he's not had enough time to draw up amendments to the capital budget. With this in mind, I would ask that all city council members email me by next Tuesday with their suggested prioritization of sections and also with any amendments that they would like to make to the capital budget. And finally, I do have a few citizens' requests. West Parker Street residents have informed me that the condition of the home on 122 West Parker Street is deplorable to say the least. Residents have voiced their concern regarding overgrown grass and, re and, and weeds. Residents have also voiced their concern that there are many rodents in the neighborhood because of this property as well as numerous stray cats. Um, Mrs. Craig, with this in mind, please cr contact Director Seitzinger and ask him to handle this situation in the best way that he sees fit. As the property is, is abandoned and it's becoming uh, quite a problem for neighbors in that specific community. Also, uh, since school season has begun, I've been contacted by both residents of Greenbush and Reese Street, as well as employees of the Career Technology Center regarding the condition of both streets. Um, neighbors and workers have informed me that there are numerous potholes making travel conditions difficult on both of these streets, which serve as, as the entrance and exit paths to the Career Technology Center. Um, with this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please contact Director Dewar and ask him to handle this situation in the best way that he sees fit. And finally, various Kaiser Valley residents have reported to me that um, the 2600 block and 2700 block of Frank Street are in very poor shape as there are numerous potholes and cracks in the road on um, these blocks making travel conditions very difficult. Residents request that the situation be handled accordingly and that these blocks are repaired so that they're in a more drivable state. With this in mind, Mrs. Craig, please add this to the list of issues to contact Director Dewar about. And that's all I have for tonight. And thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> 
I have only a few issues to discuss, but before I do, I'd like to call on Solicitor Hughes to update the public regarding the parking authority <coughs> and council's plans for the University of Scranton. Attorney Hughes, give the public the good news, please. Well, thank you, Madam President and Council. Uh, I think as everyone is aware, the city is in the process of having a private placement of a bond issue through Janie Montgomery Scott. Part of that, under the Securities Exchange Commission rules, is that there's a private placement memorandum. Um, I reviewed it. There is a section, which runs two pages on page 13 and 14, regarding the parking authority, which really was outdated, was not, uh, did not have the current facts uh, regarding the city of Scranton and the parking authority, and especially the termination of the cooperation agreement. Um, I contacted bond council regarding that at Ballard Spa in Philadelphia. Uh, she requested me to rewrite the section, um, which I did, and the pertinent part, you know, regarding the central, actually regarding the receiver taking over the operations of the parking authority and hiring central parking garage uh, to manage the facility on his behalf. And what was reported in the Scranton Tribune on Saturday um, regarding central parking's proposed budget. Uh, that budget was attached to the uh, management contract and <clears throat> is for the fiscal period of September 11th, 2012 to September 30th, 2013. Um, Central anticipates that the revenue during that, we'll say, calendar year um, will be increased from what was estimated by the parking authority of $3 million to $3,717,953. Um, in accordance with the management contract, uh, Central Parking will receive a 3% commission on all revenues in excess of $3.1 million, uh, which to me uh, is a very modest fee for the increase of revenue. Um, so that the operating expenses, including the $18,000 plus for the increase of revenue uh, that uh, would be applicable and paid to um, uh, and paid to Central Parking would be 938,000, I'm sorry, $738,000. This is approximately two-thirds of what the Scranton Parking Authority's current management was taking out, or what their expenses were, which is a savings of one-third, or almost, uh, it's almost $350,000 savings there. That would mean an estimated net revenue for the parking authority to pay its bond indentures of $2,979,000. To that we must add, because of the cooperation agreement being terminated, the $100,000 commission that the parking authority got in collecting all parking meter revenue, which was around a million dollars. So that has to be added back in because now the parking authority will not get that $100,000. In addition to that, the city in this year's budget made a grant, or makes a grant, of $586,000 to the Scranton Parking Authority. That's divided up into increments every two weeks. Uh, included within that, and that's for the seven employees, the seven meter employees, that would be $80,000 a person, which it is not. Uh, the salaries are around $30,000. Included within that figure is a $140,000 management fee. Now, what the management fee is, I have no idea. But you have to back out the management fee uh, so that that would not be payable to the parking authority. The reason the cooperation agreement was terminated was to deny the parking authority of any funds, so it would not have any funds to pay anyone. When you add that back in, the $100,000, $140,000, there would be $3,200,000 available to pay the bond issue. 
Added to that has to be in the recovery plan is the enhanced meter program, which for 2013, the estimate increase in that is $700,000. That would bring the total revenue uh, that would be available to pay the bond issue to $3.9 million. Now the $100,000, $140,000, and the $700,000, of course, is city money, and the city is a guarantor of the parking authority debt. So as a result of that, there would now be $3.9 million available to pay the bond payment, at least almost $3 million from the parking authority. It was estimated, and it was stated in the Tribune article, that the bond payments were $3.7 million. When I did my original calculation, and I sent this email out last, sent it out Wednesday, um, yesterday morning, uh, I used that figure, which meant that the city would have, by the current management and having Central involved, the city would be able to keep $200,000 that would not have to pay because of the parking authority not having sufficient monies. As you know, there's $1.6 million in this year's budget. We're going to spend all of that. This turns out to be an immediate turnaround of $1.8 million of funds because of this, uh, the action the council took back in January, and I'm sorry, back in June, when the parking authority came in and requested a million dollars, and council did not, did not pass the legislation uh, authorizing the transfer of that money from the contingency fund to make that bond payment. There's been a lot of criticism especially from the Scranton Times, what it's done to the city. What it's done for the city is the fact that it brought to light the ineptitude, the incompetence of the Scranton Parking Authority management. The bond insurers came in. The next day they informed me, they called me, and I had conversations with them. After that, council did, based on the assurances that I had from the attorneys for the insurance companies, the next week we provided for that payment, the bond payment was made. During those discussions, they told me that, number one, they would replace the trustee. Number two, they would immediately move after the trustee was replaced. They would immediately move to have a receiver appointed, and that they would then seek and hire a competent manager whose goal would be to raise the revenues for the Scranton Parking Authority and decrease its expenses. My time estimate for that to be accomplished would have been six to nine months. However, it was accomplished in an extremely short period of time of three months. Mr. Washoe was installed within two months. Central Parking was hired within the three months. And as a result, if these figures hold, well, if these figures hold, the turnaround that I put forth in my uh, email to probably about 15 lawyers and consultants and Janie Montgomery uh, was that the turnaround would have been approximately 1.8 million so that the city would not have to come up with $1.6 million payment next year and would have an extra $200,000. I've done further investigation on that and have determined that the estimate of $3.7 million uh, was incorrect. It's actually lower. And the total bond payments, now I'm using the calendar year next year from January through December, uh, are actually $3 million $487,461.25. When you add the bond payment from the anticipated revenues, that would mean that the city, by having 
taking the act, or the council by taking the action it did, uh, and really putting the Scranton Parking Authority out of business per se, uh, has resulted in almost a two million dollar swing of monies available. If these figures hold, there will not have to be anything in next year's budget, any monies, to provide for payment of any parking authority bonds. That's a $1.6 million savings. In addition, there will be an extra $400,000, so that's a $2 million swing to the positive for the city of Scranton. And to me, it's extremely good news. As I said in my email, I said that this is my response to Attorney Kelly's inquiry, and that I'm only the solicitor for Scranton City Council, and that this information is for informational purposes only. To be put in the prospectus, it should be reviewed by a financial analyst, financial consultant, or certified public accountant. Uh, and I believe they'd rely on the same figures that I have, but based on this, and of course we'll see what happens by December when the budget comes up, but it would appear that because of the action the council has taken, that right now, based on preliminary figures, we will not have to put in 1.6 to 2 million dollars in next year's budget, that the amount of revenue raised by central parking, if it's 3 million, the city of Scranton will only have to contribute, we will have to have some money in there, uh, but it would be uh, from the $100,000 revenue the parking authority got, the $140,000 management fee, there's $240,000 um, of almost $480,000. So we will have to come up with some money, but it's a tremendous swing to the positive. And that's all I have to report on the parking authority. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. No. Uh, would you like to move ahead with the uh, University of Scranton? Oh, I'd love to. I read with great consternation the fact that the University of Scranton is going to oppose the city of Scranton's parking tax. I, I will state that there's probably many directors that are on the board of directors of the University of Scranton. There are probably many people in management positions up there that do not have the history of the University of Scranton and that the University of Scranton would not have the footprint that it currently has if it were not for the city. The University of Scranton is located where it is because of a donation from the Scranton family with the Scranton estate and somewhere in the early 60s on Monroe Avenue they built a new classroom facility that was in the early 60s. That was pretty much the confines of the University of Scranton. You could not expand beyond that footprint because virtually all of the land to the east was a residential area. The, I don't know how it came about, but the University of Scranton is what it is today because of the actions that the City of Scranton and the Scranton Redevelopment Authority took. They adopted what was known as the University Plan, which is an area bounded by Moyer Court on the west, Webster Avenue on the east, Mulberry Street on the north, and Ridge Row on the south. Virtually all of that area was a, was a residential area. Many stately homes uh, were in that area. And it was adopted as a blighted area in order to conform to the urban redevelopment law so the properties could be condemned, acquired by the redevelopment authority, 
and conveyed to the University of Scranton. The plan was never challenged by any residents, and as a result, many properties were condemned, and that is how the University of Scranton gained its foothold in the Hill section in the major residential high tax producing area of the city. Um, if it were not for that plan, the University of Scranton never would have been able to expand eastward, northward, or southward. In fact, in any direction. The city really came to the rescue of the University of Scranton and in later years even vacated large portions of Linden Street in order to make a campus. I thought it very ironic that, and I, I looked at it after giving this some consideration, that the city of Scranton uh, created its own Trojan horse, such as the Greeks did with the ancient city of Troy. And I'm sure everybody knows the story of the Trojan horse. Uh, this is, I think, very apropos, especially since the former dean of the Graduate Business School of the University of Scranton wrote a very influential book called Inside the Trojan Horse. It is currently out of publication. There are copies available at the University of Scranton Library and probably also at the Scranton Public Library. Dr. Strickland was a, has his PhD in economics from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, taught economics at the University of Scranton and ultimately became the dean of the graduate school at the University of Scranton. Inside the Trojan Horse was a book that's very critical of authorities in Pennsylvania, especially since they become too powerful. They end up controlling or having much more influence over the municipalities that they're supposed to serve. They end up to be out on a frolic of their own, to a free will, a free spirit, and there's really no way to control them. Because he was so critical of the authorities, Gene Peters, Mayor, Gene, Mayor Eugene Peters appointed Dr. Strickland to both the boards of the Redevelopment Authority and the Scranton Housing Authority. I serve with great pride on both the Scranton Redevelopment Authority and the Scranton Housing Authority with Dr. Strickland. And what has happened now and it's been echoed, I'll say, week after week, month after month, almost year after year, that the city should do something in order to curtail the University of Scranton. What can be done is that right now, the University of Scranton is beyond its institutional district. It is spreading into the residential areas up in the hill section. They've acquired vast amounts of property. They have built a dormitory on Mulberry Street in an R1 zone. There's a small sliver of that that is a, C, a C1 zone. But most of it is constructed within an R2 zone. They had to go before the Scranton Zoning Board in order to get variances. One variance should never have been granted, and that's a use variance. Every variance they request should have been denied. They have established parking lots in residential zones for which they had to have had a variance. It is my recommendation to the council since the Scranton Zoning Hearing Board is an independent agency, totally separate and distinct from the city of Scranton, that the city of Scranton has standing to oppose any variance is filed by anyone. I believe that from this day forward, due to the fact that the University of Scranton that has a budget which ended May 31st, 2011, of $227,883,304. That's on their charitable tax return. That was their gross, which is approximately three times 
the city's budget. They had expenses of $185,038,781, which means that they had a gross profit of $42,844,523. Now, I know I'll be, I'll be chastised for saying it's a profit. This is what they filed with their charitable, uh, their 990, I think it's 999S tax return. It has to be determined. If they're going to take the city of Scranton to court, how much of that $42 million actually goes towards charitable purposes? And I think that the city should vigorously, and this is not my function, it's easy for me to say, but I think the city should vigorously challenge the filing that they are an iliomycinary institution. There's a lot of money in here that they can use to pay the cities, to pay the, help the city and pay a fair share to the city of Scranton as is set forth in the recovery plan. They should take a good look at this and everything that the city of Scranton has done for the University of Scranton over the last 50 years and take a look and do what Brown University did to the city of Providence, Rhode Island. They should kick in a couple of million dollars to the city because if it weren't for the city, they wouldn't have the institution they have. And as I said, it's a Trojan horse because now they're outside, they're gobbling up more and more property, taking it off the tax rolls, going in because they're outside the institutional district and having to get variances. It had been my recommendation to council that Mrs. Craig write a letter to the Scranton Zoning Hearing Board and that every time the University of Scranton files an application for a variance that the Zoning Hearing Board give the mayor and council notice of the fact that they have a variance. If the city does not file an objection to the granting of a variance anywhere to the north of Mulberry Street, to the east of Webster Avenue, to the south of Moyer Court, and I know they can't go any more than Ridge Avenue because I think the Lackawanna River is there. But anyway, that I will appear before the Zoning Board on behalf of Council and object to the granting of any variance. It's one way to stop the University of Scranton from gobbling up any more properties knowing that they will not receive variances, that they will not be able to get a variance to construct anything north of Mulberry Street or east of Webster Avenue. Uh, one of the speakers tonight gave me another idea. I really think that so we will be fair to all nonprofits. I think any time a nonprofit makes an application for a variance before the Zoning Hearing Board, no matter who the nonprofit is, council should be notified. Yes. And we should object. I don't care if it's the medical school, Marywood, you know, a hospital. I don't care if it's a small nonprofit that wants to acquire a property, knock it down and put a parking lot in in a residential zone. It should be denied. And that's the way that we're going to get control. And it's the only way that we can get control of this area of the city, and many areas of the city, back to where it should be. And I have nothing further. If anybody has any questions on council, I'd be glad to answer them. Mrs. Craig, if we can send that letter as soon as possible, please, to the Zoning Board, uh, that council wishes to be notified of the appearance of any nonprofit before the Zoning Board seeking a variance for expansion. And I'm sure members of council and our solicitor will be present and vigorously opposing any further expansions in this city, which has been financially raped by the loss of tax, tax paying properties. Madam President, one thing I didn't say is the, the fact that that dormitory on the northerly side of Mulberry Street legally never should have been built. The two residents that, that took exceptions were on solid ground Mm -hmm. because that was a use variance. In accordance with the law, that use variance could not be granted. And 
the granting of all of these variances for parking lots in these residential districts do not meet the requirements of the law. And as such, if those people that did take, I don't know why they withdrew the repeal, that's not my concern, but they did. If they continued with their appeal, I have no doubt in my mind that they would have won. It may be that they were bought out. I, Jack, I have no idea. <laughs> I've seen some properties over there that were purchased for 27000 and the university paid 550 two years later without any improvements. So, you know, when you have big money, I'm not saying that's what happened, but uh, we could all surmise. And there's never an issue in making those purchases. They're done regularly. And as you said, at um, quite increased prices. Um, and I've noticed as well that um, the university, for example, is moving farther and farther into the downtown. Well, the, the thing is, in, it's zoning. Lawyer Court is between Jefferson and Madison Avenue. It's behind the old Emanuel Baptist Church. Um, that's the end of the line for, a, for an institutional district. Now as they start coming into town, you're into different areas of zoning where maybe some of the things that, that they're purchasing and doing, they can legally do because it's in the proper zone. What I'm saying is that even if they're in a commercial district and they want to do something there where they have to have a variance, we -hmm. should object. Yes, and we will. And that until they realize that they cannot expand. If they buy another house up there with the idea that they're going to knock it down and add to other vacant land and put up another dormitory, they have to have a use variance. And there's no way that they should, legally can get it. And we have to object. It's the way to keep the pressure, to keep them. We can't push them back in to inside the institutional district, but we can keep that institutional district from further expanding into a residential zone. Well, uh, thank you. Just while we're on that subject, something touched my mind. And uh, <clears throat> we've written letters about this previously. Uh, the street signage on Mulberry Street. Since, since the university is working on that corridor, is it their responsibility to replace the signage? Or is it still the city's responsibility? Because there are no street signs from, I believe, Jefferson up to Webster or, or beyond. And we've had numerous uh, rear-end accidents for people looking for Quincy Avenue from out of town to go to Moses Taylor Hospital. We've brought this, sh this issue up several times here and sent letters with no response. I was just wondering, can we send a letter? Uh, who would we find out who's responsible? Since, since those light poles and all are part of the project of the university, is the signage part of their, you know, their deal with this Mulberry Street? Something has to be done. I mean, it's, it's been without signs for a long mm -hmm. time. And I've had a lot of people come to me, and we've sent letters previously, and another situation where we don't get any response. But I don't know. You know who we would send. What do I look like? The answer man. Pardon? What do I look like? The answer man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I have no idea what that Mulberry Street quarter. I mean, that that was there with the uh, state money and with, with PennDOT and everything else. I, I have no idea on that. But um, maybe you write a letter to the city solicitor and ask them. Okay, because I know it's not a state road from Jefferson Avenue up. It's city. I would add one further comment, and it goes to what was stated before about BRTIs. Paul Kelly and I have had discussions. He's upset about it, just like I am, and that's why I'm coordinating my thoughts with him as to how to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could, I'd like to be excused. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because of the 2013 increase in city real estate taxes, I'd like to ask Scranton tax collector Bill Courtright to extend the 2013 discount period from the last working day in February to the last working day in March. 
I spoke with Mayor Doherty yesterday, and he agreed with this proposal. Also, I spoke with Mr. Courtright, and he is most willing to help the city taxpayers. He asks only for a letter from the city administration stating its concurrence with city council in requesting an extended discount period in 2013. In order to prepare for this change in a timely fashion, Mr. Courtright needs this letter quickly, and thereafter he will speak with the county and school district on our behalf to obtain their approval. I thank Mr. Courtright for his gracious assistance in this matter. Therefore, Mrs. Craig, please deliver Council's letter tomorrow, if possible, to the Mayor, requesting that the administration provide a letter to tax collector Courtright concerning the extension of the discount period for 2013 city real estate taxes. Thank you. City Council recognizes the hardship incurred with the tax increase. As a result, we will do whatever we possibly can to assist taxpayers. Next, OECD Director Linda Abley will participate in a public caucus at 6 p.m. next Thursday, September 27th, to explain items 5B and C, which are included in tonight's agenda for introduction. Both pieces of legislation pertain to use of CDBG monies for advance payment uh, of the Hilton Hotel Section 108 loan. And finally, due to the scheduling of the public caucus prior to next week's regularly scheduled council meeting, Mrs. Craig, please uh, reschedule the caucus with representatives of Central Parking and Mr. Washoe to another date. And that's it. 5B, amending file of council number 53, 2011, entitled an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the Consolidated Submission for Community Planning and Development Programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant Program, Home Investment Partnership Program, and Emergency Solutions Grants Program. The purpose of this amendment is to allocate unobligated funds in the amount of $281,782.99 to the activity known as the Scranton 108 loan repayment for the Hotel and Conference Center under promissory note B-99-MC-42-0014. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C. Amending resolution number 674, 2000, as amended, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to execute and enter into promissory notes B-99-MC-42-0014 series and all other necessary loan documents in the amount of $3 million with the registered holder after watch and company with the registered holder after watch and company as security for an advance of monies from the United States Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development for the Hotel and Conference Center project. The purpose of this amendment is to authorize a defeasance of the City of Scranton's remaining obligation under a portion of promissory note B-99-MC-42-0014 authorizing the establishment of a defeasance account with the Bank of New York Mellon as trustee and further authorizing the funding of the defeasance account with funds from the City of Scranton CDBG Action Plans of 2011 and 2012, and further authorizing the Mayor and appropriate officials of the City of Scranton to execute all documentation necessary to accomplish the defeasance of a portion of the principal due under the above reference note. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, 
All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth Order, 6A, reading by title, file of council number 56, 2012, in ordinance, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant Program, Home Investment Partnership Program, and Emergency Solutions Grant Program for the period beginning January 1st, 2013. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question? Uh, when would the final reading of this be? I believe it is October 25th. Yeah. It's a 30-day wait. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And Mr. Rogan, since um, Ms. Abley will be present next week at the caucus, perhaps you could, at that point, ask her about the suggestions yeah. that were and presented this evening by... Absolutely. And I'll also email those to her in advance, if, just in case she has to look into them a little bit. Thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 6B, reading by title, file of council number 59, 2012, in ordinance, providing for the acceptance of certain streets, open space parcels, and stormwater facilities in the Mountain Lake Estate subdivision located in the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Also, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept for the sum of $1 and record in the Lackawanna County Recorder of Deeds official records a deed for the above mentioned lands and right of ways. You've heard reading by title of item 6B. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6B pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6C, reading by title, file of council number 60, 2012, in ordinance. Creating and establishing a general fund account 01101860 titled First Liberty Bank Escrow Account City of Scranton Earned Income Tax Sinking Fund for the receipt and disbursement of 2012 earned income tax revenue to be drawn down by amalgamated bank on a monthly <coughs> basis for payment on the TAN Series B-2012. You've heard reading by title of item 6C. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6C pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I would like to make a motion to table item 7A. Second. Second. We have a motion on the floor and a second on the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 7B, for consider, oh, excuse me. <coughs> I'd also like to make a motion to amend item 7B per the following. Number one amending the last line in the title by inserting after 50 years as required by the grant. Number two, in the second whereas clause, insert the number 42 after resolution. Number three, in the third whereas clause, insert after the grant for 50 years as required by the grant. In the fourth whereas clause, insert after after for 50 years as required by the grant after the fourth number five after the fourth whereas clause insert whereas the deed from the city of scranton to the scranton public library association is subject to the deed from william smith et al to the city of scranton dated Aug april 5th 1890 and recorded in the Lackawanna County Deed, Book 100, page 47, which requires the Albright Memorial Library building to be a free public library for the use and benefit of the citizens and residents of the city of Scranton forever. In parentheses, the deed. <coughs> Number six, 
in the now therefore clause insert after for 50 years as required by the grant and in perpetuity as required by the deed. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. second. On the question? Um, I would personally like to thank uh, uh, Attorney Hughes for um, doing these clarifications too and really um, putting into words what the original intent of the legislation was and uh, I thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 7B for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, Resolution Number 41, 2012, as amended, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate city officials to enter into a grant agreement with Keystone Recreation Park and Conservation Fund requiring the City of Scranton to commit to a grant requirement to assure that the Albright Memorial Library Building will be used as an undisturbed use by the public as a library, as a library only for 50 years as required by the grant. As chair for the, the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7B as amended. Second. Second. On the question? This is seventh order. Pardon? Isn't seventh order, we need a roll call. Yes. <laughs> No one's on the question then. <laughs> no. no. Okay. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B as amended, legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, Resolution Number 42, 2012, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate city officials to apply for a grant application and, if successful, to enter into a grant agreement and accept the funds related thereto, a Keystone Recreation Park and Conservation Fund grant in the amount of $500,000 for repairs to the historic Albright Memorial Library. As chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Lascom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.